it's already on the plane. I remember the stewardess is uh, informing me, Mr. Soschner, uh, you know that uh, you have a very small time window and you need to hurry. Please come to the business class for the, for, for the, for the landing and then just take your stuff and run out. And it felt like running a marathon on Toronto <laughs> Airport because they have this, I don't know if it was a special lane, but it looks like that the employees are prepared for such cases. And <laughs> uh, they basically cheered the guests who ran to the same airplane, uh, cheered them on and opened the doors. And it was very kind and polite. This is this is the only <laughs> thing that I know from Toronto. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And it's funny because the, I mean, there's a small city, down, a small airport down town but mm -hmm. that airport's actually in mississauga it's you know 30 minute drive from downtown usually so 30 minutes yeah about 25 i mean at least i'm sort of in the west end of the downtown core and it's without traffic 25 minutes on the highway um but by transit you know probably 45 to an hour at least yeah that's not that's not much that's very quick basically well, it's, it's not bad yeah um yeah how is yeah, life no, how is life in toronto these days it's good. Um, I so I'm I grew up here. This is where I was born and raised. I mean, it's a it's a really big city. The metro area is over four million, um, and oh. there's a lot a lot of suburbs. Like really, it's it's like a huge urban sprawl. I mean, um, there's a lot of cities that are not technically Toronto, but people from those sort of outer suburbs will probably just say they're from Toronto for simplicity's sake if they're talking to someone who's not local. And, you know, driving from one end of that area to the other could be two, three hours on the highway. Um, oh. So it's, yeah, and people do that commute pretty regularly. I mean, I have coworkers who commute two hours to get downtown mm -hmm. to the lab, um, which is which is a lot, but that's what people do if they want to have houses with backyards and, <laughs> and garages and space, so. Yeah, I remember, I mean, I grew up in Europe, in Central Europe, and um and never, it felt normal to me. And when I was in Canada for the first time, the Canadians informed me that things are different in Canada. <laughs> you have a lot of land and not so much people. So there's a lot of space in between towns. Exactly. And when we visited some villages in Nova Scotia, it felt like basically driving for hours on an empty road. Nobody and they said, what happens when the car runs out of uh, gas? <laughs> well, then you have a problem because sometimes there's no mobile signal. How do you? How is life for you in uh, in Canada? What do you like uh, in Canada? Yeah, so so yeah, I was saying. So I, I grew up here, born and raised, lived here my whole life. Um, and I mean, how I like to talk about Toronto is that it's a really nice place to live, and it's pretty good for everything. Like I think by population, it's the fourth or fifth biggest city in North America. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really does have have everything that you need or anything you'd want to do, whatever you're into, it's here. There's plenty of people. It's super, super diverse. Like really, like people, for example, say that Berlin is very diverse, very multicultural, not compared to Toronto, <laughs> like not even close. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just like, it's a very nice place to live. It's comfortable. I mean, the cost of how, living- How, out of curiosity, how would I uh, find out that Toronto is a diverse city? Uh, can I say more diverse than Berlin? But what uh, specifically should I look out for? I, th I think you'll just notice by walking around and <laughs> being surrounded by people from everywhere. Um, it's it's really amazing. I mean, like any kind of cuisine you'd want, you would get here. For an example, my mom is Filipino. My dad immigrated here from Belarus in like the 70s. Um, and they met here and, you know, we only spoke English at home because they only have English as a common language. And uh, that seems kind of normal to me to be like half half Russian and half Filipino, basically. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not the only one. Like I've heard of others who have the same background. I, I used to joke that I'm one of two Russian Filipinos that you'll meet and the other is my sister. But I've been informed since then that. <laughs> but, it, that but, it, um, but it makes you full Canadian. <laughs> so Exactly. Well, for those for that reason, I, I feel very, very Canadian. It's just like this is kind of normal. I mean, um, is, is there anybody? I mean, the people uh, I visited in Nova Scotia, I, I think they came from everywhere. So it's uh, Middle East, Russia, China, Europe, uh, United States, South America. Do, is there anyone in Canada who is not an immigrant or doesn't have an immigrant? Well, history? I mean, 
at some point everyone was an immigrant, I suppose. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean, there's plenty, like for example, if you go to the smaller towns in Canada, and again, like you said, Canada is a really big place. Like our geography is more similar to Australia than the United States. You know, a lot of space, a lot of land that isn't good for agriculture, just forests and tundra and Arctic, and then and then basically, I think something like 80 or 90 percent of Canada's population lives within I think 100 kilometers of the U.S. border <laughs> just all along the south end and all of those major cities are really far from each other it's not like you're I mean driving to Montreal which people do regularly it's like five and a half six hours driving non-stop on the highway at 100 it's like, kilometers an hour it's similar to, Vi to Vienna Munich basically it's also five yeah, hours yeah. And we don't have we don't have good rail service. So yeah, I mean if you go to small But towns, I think to sorry to interrupt you, but uh yeah. I think the difference is when I drive from Vienna to Munich, I have a lot of villages, a lot of cities, a lot of big cities on the way. And basically I, it feels like I never leave a city. So it's yeah. one village yeah. after the other. I right. remember traveling in, in Canada, it's like you have uh Montreal, Montreal and uh Toronto, and in between nothing. Basically yeah. Just fields and then and small towns along the highway, which was built along basically the route of an old rail line so there are some small towns along there just there's an older smaller highway um i can go on about the history of the, the 401 the trans canada highway but i wanted to just mention about toronto i mean the the history of the city is it's interesting because over the last say 100 years there have been waves of immigration um you know at some point portuguese people there was like a lot of portuguese folks from the azores who immigrated here and then this is maybe in the 70s like I actually live in little Portugal that's my neighborhood um and like back then they were like the minority and before then it was maybe Italians and then it was sort of in the 80s 90s that there was a lot of immigration from Hong Kong and from China after um and then India and Caribbean so there have been these these sort of waves um of immigration and now it's just you know Canada has a lot of space and we I mean from what I understand our our policy is that we want people to immigrate here because there are jobs and and we need we need more people in the country so <laughs> so yeah what brought you what brought you then into science i mean you grew up in canada and beautiful country beautiful land i mean hiking and spending time outdoors would be my normal reaction of first thought what brought you towards science science yeah i mean i i think i've always been very interested in science um that was i don't know I was a curious child, so I liked understanding how the world around me worked. Um, but it wasn't until I was almost finishing high school that the idea of maybe becoming a scientist and doing that as a career became more apparent as I started to learn about the world around me and and how how jobs work. Um, so I, I always knew that I wanted, like, I, I actually really enjoyed philosophy and political science and, and studying literature. Um, but you know, going to university, I was being a little bit pragmatic thinking, okay, if I'm taking student loans to, uh, to go to school, it would be great to study philosophy, and I could probably get a job after maybe go to law school or something. But let me, you know, I like science, maybe a little bit more even or equally. And, uh, and I at least at the time felt like it would have a better chance of getting me a, a good paying job eventually, not exactly knowing what that job would be. I, I actually wanted to study engineering, but I didn't get accepted to the program I applied to. Um, so I didn't get into engineering and I, you know, engineering just seemed even more direct in terms of finding, finding a job after, like as a, as a young child, I wanted to be a mechanic because I just found machines fascinating. And then I started to understand that, oh, you know, designing them is probably more fun <laughs> than getting my hands all greasy and fixing them. Um, so yeah, so science really, I I was very interested in, um, I guess I'll give you the, the, the origin story here. I mean, I decided to study life sciences because I was very inspired by the possibilities of synthetic biology. Um, and it's it's funny because the thing that got me so inspired was actually a dystopian novel by Margaret Atwood. Oh, really? uh, author yeah it's it's a novel called orcs and crake um so i read it in grade when i was you know 16 or 17 and it's this dystopian near science fiction novel where uh essentially the future no longer has nation states instead corporations have regions of control and the most powerful corporations in the world are all biopharma companies biotechnology has advanced tremendously and now if you need an organ transplant we grow organs in humanized pigs 
this still wasn't a thing, you know, back in the mid 2000s when when this book was written. Now, now people are doing this. Um, but, you know, if you need a skin graft, they spray stem cells on. Uh, they no longer need to do factory farming because they can just grow chicken meat on these bio organic sort of scaffolds. They have all kinds of cute hybrid pets. It's just like biotech rules the world. But of course, then bioterrorism and, and bioweapons are the major threats. So the, there are these compounds that these corporations have where they keep their people living inside there. And then there's like the diseased sort of slumlands. Um, and anyway, so it's a dystopian novel, but I was learning about the basics of cell and molecular biology and genetics and biochemistry while, while reading this book. And uh, the book is great. And I realized that a lot of this technology that is being described here is feasible within my lifetime. Uh, you know, I'm learning about restriction enzymes and CRISPR didn't exist then, but molecular cloning was very much a thing. And I thought, wow, you know, we will see these things before my time here is over. And I think it would be really cool to be a part of this. Um, but there was no synthetic biology specific program at the time. This, I started university in 2011. Uh, so I decided to just do general life sciences. And uh, as I started studying and learning more and getting deeper into you know, what is known about biology, I realized that there's just a lot of open questions and a lot that we don't understand. And if we want to engineer biology from first principles in a rational way, because genetic engineering is still kind of genetic tinkering, um, we need to understand a lot more about how the system works. So that's that's where I developed an interest in, in proteomics and genomics and, and systems biology to try to collect a lot of data and see if we could make sense of it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was basically what happened. I started doing... Uh, some research in undergrad just to get experience, get my foot in the door, because I knew if I wanted to pursue a scientific career, I'd have to get a PhD. Um, so yeah, I worked in a bunch of different labs and different projects. I initially started off uh, doing an iGEM project, which is a synthetic biology um, contest. I don't know if, you've, if you or other listeners uh, maybe have heard of it, but it's the biggest synthetic biology competition in the world. It was started at MIT in 2005. And basically undergrad teams do projects and then present them at the conference um, projects in synthetic biology. So that's how it all started. And then I decided to stay in Toronto for my PhD, actually in the same department that I did my bachelor's degree in, uh, because it's very, well, the department is molecular genetics and I can talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, but I just, I basically realized that if I was going to stay in Canada, this was the place I would want to do the PhD. I mean, there's other, other good schools, but this was my first choice, or I would be applying to schools in the in the U.S., but it didn't really make sense at the time for me to uplift my <laughs> uplift my whole life and move to this to the U.S. for that. As a, as a European, I have to ask the question: Why not Europe? <laughs> I didn't. I, I mean, maybe it just seemed further away and uh, less accessible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's may, maybe the the short answer. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I think it's minimum. It's minimum nine nine hours. Depends where you are in Europe, but uh, sometimes no direct flights. Sometimes uh, stopovers. Exactly. Except the very expensive flights, which uh, I would not advise to as an economist. Um, but we have some some parts in synthetic biology also here in Europe in Austria. We have a company and uh, I think also a very well known research organization, research institute in Austria is uh, doing work groundwork in that. Um, mm -hmm. What are use cases in th synthetic biology that uh, will come to the market soon? What, uh, what what can we do with that? Oh man, yeah. Well, synthetic biology. I, I will preface that that is not not my field of, of study directly. Um, oops, oh. <laughs> patients popping up. That's just kind of what inspired me to pursue biology initially. But I recently was at a synthetic biology conference or, or sort of a, a summit that showed off a lot of really cool things. I mean, in some ways, you can think of synthetic biology as being regular biotechnology in some ways, you know, developing antibody drugs like synthetic biology is already affecting the lives of millions and millions and millions of people um, through the creation of therapeutics uh, but i mean there's also a lot of cool products that are that are either on the market or will be on the market soon that use engineered bacteria to do all kinds of cool things um there's um, yeah i don't have the names off the top of my head but you know there are companies creating aggregates for you know concrete that actually sequesters co2 because they have these bacteria that 
form these fibrous structures, <laughs> which is really amazing. So they're basically like fermenting concrete aggregate um, or cement rather. What else? There's, there's, I mean, um, all sorts of bioremediation stuff. Um, of course, manufacturing small molecules and drugs done in yeast, right? Or, or in engineered mammalian cells. Um, there's some really exciting stuff. Like there's a few companies that are trying to do these humanized pigs where we will, I, you know, be able to grow organs for transplants in humans, but in pigs that will be less immunogenic. It's like, it's really crazy. And I mean, I think biology in general inspires me because it's, it's, it's like letting us understand the fabric of what makes us what we are, maybe not who we are, but what we are physically, we are like meat robots and this is <laughs> we're trying to reverse engineer the most complicated machine in the world <laughs> um so we can fix it when it goes wrong or or create better forms of it you know <laughs> what is what is a human a meat robot <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a great explanation <laughs> um did, did, did you hear you right you mentioned uh bacteria that can eat and digest concrete no, no, no. They're producing um, the actual concrete, and and I can find Pro it. producing. Yeah, well, really, that's, that's great. Making concrete. I I should have the name, but I'll I'll pull it up in a second. It is yeah. They, they produce calcium carbonate crystals around sand particles. So this is the same same way that seashells um, form. And where is it? Yeah, the company is called. Sorry, I just have another window behind here so this is basically then the construction solution for the future you don't uh, send out the workers you send out the bacteria and uh, yeah <laughs> you, you program them to uh produce certain forms and build houses <laughs> it's it's really it's really amazing stuff yeah so that's just that's one example um and there's a company that already has products on the market what, what's I'll the business idea? what do, do you know what's the business idea behind uh such an invention I think it's just it's just the cost of production of these uh of these aggregate you know particulate stuff that's being used to make to make cement uh that is the thing and i can i i know where i can find this actually if uh it, it, it's, it's, it's not important it's not about uh but you mentioned <laughs> synthetic biology inspired you to uh look more towards molecular biology molecular uh, genetics and you're working in a different field now what's what's your field yeah so um I guess I'll give a bit of background on on my my status as a as a PhD candidate PhD student. Um, so I'm in the Department of Molecular Genetics, and molecular genetics is a very broad term. It's like saying biology. We're just referring to the scale that we're interested in, you know, the cell and molecular or genome level. Um, so within my department, there's probably over 150 labs, I think, across everything from computational biology to developmental biology, cancer. Um, cell and molecular, of course, then systems biology, functional genomics, functional proteomics. Uh, so the lab that I'm in, um, I, so I'm in Anne-Claude Jengras's lab at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute, which is part of Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, we're one of the one of the nodes for the Department of Molecular Genetics. So we do functional proteomics. And uh, a lot of people are familiar with genomics, study of the human genome using DNA sequencing. The human proteome or any proteome is to the genome what proteins are to genes. So if, we, if we're saying all of your genes, it's your genome, all of the proteins in an organism or a cell, that is the proteome. So, I mean, we could refer to uh, a metaproteome of all the proteins in the environment, for example. Um, but we basically are doing human proteomics. And proteomics is, is really a field of, of tools that are then applied to different questions in biology. Um, so typically we use mass spectrometry to identify proteins in a sample and um, mass spectrometry it's if people aren't familiar with this a mass spectrometer is almost like a scale for for ions for <laughs> for molecules um, we measure the the mass of molecules that are injected and their electrical charge and then based on this we can trace that back to the peptides that are going into the machine that have been ionized so um, since we know the sequences of, of all or most of the genes in the human genome, we also know what their amino acid sequence is predicted to be. So we, we already kind of have a library of reference peptides that we can then map back and, and using this. So again, there's all these complicated database search steps and computational processing steps, but the machine collects all these mass spectra um, and 
then we can say what proteins were in that sample. Um, so proteomics, again, it's there's, there's a lot of methods in it. Mass spectrometry is not the only uh, modality, I guess, or method of identifying proteins. There's other, other systems as well, uh, but we use mass spectrometry. So our lab is sort of 50% people developing methods and techniques for mass spectrometry based proteomics, whether it's the sample preparation or instrumentation or computational. And the other half is biologists using these tools to study different phenomena, different systems inside cells. Um, everything from signaling to cell biology to you know cancer, cancer regulation in some cases or other diseases. Um, so I'll get a little deeper now. Uh, we're, we're also the core facility for our institute, and my, my supervisor was recently uh, appointed as director of our research institute, so very exciting times for us. Uh, but yeah, specifically, I've been using a technique called BioID, which I'll, I'll explain for, for the listeners. So BioID is a proximity, proximity labeling, an in vivo proximity labeling technique. Um, if anyone listening is, is familiar with APMS, Affinity Purification Mass Spectrometry, uh, that's maybe a good analog. And I can start off by explaining affinity purification. Basically, you have a protein of interest. It's tagged with something. And you want to identify what its binding partners are. So you want to see what proteins are in the complex that it is a member of or, or who it's interacting with. So we can pull down those tagged proteins of interest. We call that a bait. And then we identify the proteins that come down with it. We call those preys. So we have this bait prey relationship and, and you can reconstruct protein-protein uh, interaction networks by doing this many times. So, so BioID is very similar, but instead of pulling down your bait protein of interest, you actually put a tag onto the bait protein of interest. This tag is an enzyme um, called biotin. Well, it is a biotin ligase. There's a few different variations of it. Biotin ligase, so if people are familiar with biotin, that's a, it's a small molecule, molecule, I think vitamin B7 or one of the B vitamins, something you have in your bodies. And this is a biotin ligase. So it's an enzyme that takes biotin and basically sticks it onto other proteins. That has been, so this biotin ligase has been taken from a bacteria, cloned into, into a system where now your protein of interest is tagged, and then it is expressed in vivo in your cell line. Um, and it goes and it does whatever it's supposed to do, but this biotin ligase that's attached to your protein, what it does is it will activate surrounding biotin, uh, and that activated biotin AMP becomes highly reactive and it covalently labels neighboring proteins. So you can think of it as it's just labeling everything that's within a close proximity of your protein of interest. So those sounds, so, sounds like administration work. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Sounds like administration work, <laughs> labeling everything. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything gets labeled, um, and because uh, we ha we we have this other protein called streptavidin, it has a very very high binding affinity for for biotin. We can pull down all the biotinylated proteins, and then identify them in the mass spec. Um, so I've been using this BioID technique to basically map out the protein composition of structures in the cell nucleus. Um, and these are structures called nuclear bodies. They're membraneless substructures. Uh, for any listeners who are familiar with the nucleolus that you may have learned about in school, that nucleus inside the nucleus, the nucleolus is the largest and best known and most studied nuclear body, but there's a whole bunch of others. Um, and I won't dwell on nuclear bodies for too long. They are super fascinating, um, involved in all kinds of key and core regulatory processes. Um, they're, they seem to be very important. I mean, uh, they're well conserved evolutionarily, at least through through all mammals. So evolution thinks that nuclear bodies are important, so they're probably doing something important. And of course, if you if you remove them or disrupt them, we do have developmental defects and other um, you know other problems. So I the thing is they're hard to study. So you can't really just isolate them directly using traditional biochemical techniques. Hence the use of BioID, so we can do this sort of spatial spatial mapping um, and try to get a a different view of which proteins are found within the nuclear bodies. And if we know what proteins are there, then we can understand how they're working together, hopefully. Uh, what is your PhD thesis about? Exactly what I just described. Exactly this, okay. Exactly. Um, 
then i mean it, it's uh interesting for basic research i'm pretty sure and you can make a lot of publications phd theses and probably also find one or the other patents and then guys like me come along and uh with an economic background uh looking into businesses and then ask usually the question uh what can we do with that what are practical applications uh potential products, potential mm -hmm. use cases that uh, a pharma company could then bring to the market to help people. What are practical use cases for the part of the audience that is not familiar with science? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is so this is actually I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I think this will touch on a lot of things that we're going to discuss today. Um, so I mean, I this project, it is very much a basic research project. I'm, I'm not trying to cure any disease. Um, I'm not looking at specific disease biology related to these nuclear bodies we're just trying to understand how they work inside the cell you know what is even there it's it's sort of very basic questions about these structures that every one of your cells has um the thing is they are linked to diseases uh the nuclear body that i've that i've focused on the most it's called the paraspeckle components of the paraspeckle are involved in neurodegenerative diseases like als and alzheimer's um, but the function of the paraspeckle is not really known so its role in, in this pathogenesis is completely unclear. And there are definitely people working on ways of maybe modulating it or, or just or perturbing it to see if it affects disease states and different different models. But honestly, like I, I didn't go into this trying to cure any disease. I just thought hopefully one day this knowledge will be useful for someone who is. Um, and I'll talk, you know, when we're talking about DSI in a little bit, I'll talk about uh, the difference between basic research and and translational research or something that may eventually generate ip like you mentioned patents i never would have considered i don't think there's anything i could patent in my phd i'm just basically building a, a resource for people to be able to study these structures better um sounds now, sounds sounds to me as a summary that um your research helps understanding biology better you mentioned that uh, yeah. basically and this is, I think, for uh, translational research, or the, the, especially chemists, always complain that they say we don't understand biology really, so we don't know what uh, what's working and what's not. And your yeah. invention could help understand the the uh, the complex uh, complex system better. Is that is this uh, to... that's yeah that I'd say that's totally accurate. Um, and and it's funny because if I was working on something a little more directly translational. Um, things might have gone pretty differently because I, I actually, after all these years of pursuing science, a few years ago, I started changing career directions. I mean, I had gone into the PhD intending to pursue an academic career. As a result, I, I've had a lot of collaborations, you know, five or six publications already through those collaborations, um, basically applying BioID to different systems, things in the nucleus. And this is all, this is all fine. You know, those collaborations aren't helping my PhD get finished any faster, but I thought this is how you build credibility for an academic career. And this is important um, because my plan was to do a postdoc and then try to be a professor and have my own lab and then maybe spin out a biotech company if I, if I develop something useful. Um, but that was, you know, a question, a question for the future. And it was actually during COVID that I started thinking it was about four ish years into the PhD and all the lockdowns happened and I was sort of starting to think okay let me plan out next steps like at that point I still wanted to do a postdoc and pursue academia knowing the risks and the sacrifices needed and and the low pay that postdocs get and all these other things that drive people away from academic careers but I am very passionate about science and I, I really enjoy talking about this and learning about it and studying it and uh, I don't enjoy everything about it, like actually doing the experiments. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I would rather not do them, but... <laughs> but nothing you, in the world is just pleasure. There is always some pain. Also. Exactly, exactly. It makes, makes the pleasure worth it. it. makes you appreciate it. But yeah, I, I, at that point, I was still set on an academic career. And then, <laughs> it's funny, I've, I've always had very diverse interests, even within, you know, my my field or within cell and molecular biology in general. Like, I, I'm always going to different... Or, Back when we had a lot of in-person seminars, pre-COVID, I was going to seminars all the time just to get broad exposure to different topics because I just find it really cool. It's just, it's cool stuff. <laughs> um, and and I, I started thinking, okay, here's a bunch of topics that I'd be interested in pursuing for a postdoc. And I set up a little career development chat with my supervisor. And I, I said to her, here's 10 topics that I think are really cool. These are all things that are 
sort they aren't really a thing yet like you know specific types of proteomics in, in at the tissue level for example um or some synthetic biology stuff share this list of topics and i'm like who are the best people in the world to talk to about these topics or like be co-supervised on some of these topics where i could do something like really interesting that would be like very collaborative and broadly applicable new platforms new technologies stuff like that um and, and she she basically said boris this isn't how this is how you do it. You need to find the one topic you are most passionate about working on, and then we'll find you the best place to work on that because you're going to work on this for the next 20 years at least. So, you, you know, you have to pick the thing that you are so excited to work on for the next 20 years that you'll move wherever. And I just thought this, this is impossible. How, how could I pick one thing to work on? Like all these things sound great. And I, I, I sort of started thinking, okay, maybe, maybe an academic career isn't for me. Maybe I'll, I'll pursue an industry postdoc. And then if a biopharma company wants to pay me a lot of money to work on something, it's probably <laughs> important, which means it's probably interesting and it'll be way better paid than academia. And that just started me on the path of learning about the biopharma industry. Um, and eventually coming to the conclusion that I would actually be happier working outside of the lab. Um, I'm a very extroverted person and I do find science somewhat isolating at times, like using my research as an example, there's a handful of people in the world who I could talk to about exactly what I work on at the same level at which I think about it on a daily basis, because I'm at this intersection of, of a niche field and then proteomics and a specific area of proteomics in which our lab is one of the leading labs and it's like it's interesting but it's isolating and you sure very, you can, very no, specialized very specialized as as everything is in in science really like um but i'm more of a generalist and and ultimately i think i especially lockdowns and being at home and thankfully not alone my, my wife was here um with me i i just i sort of grew to accept that i would be like it was more important to me to be in a job that was more interactive where I would be talking to people more than not talking to people like I love I love reading and I like writing but really it's talking to people about interesting things and solving problems that gets me the most energized um so I thought okay maybe there's something rewarding I could do career-wise after my PhD outside of the lab started looking at biopharma naturally because there's a clear fit with my my background knowledge um started just, this is two or three years ago, started chatting with everyone in my network who worked in, in the industry to understand what they do and what they like about it or where, you know, how I can get these jobs, reading books, reading blogs, and just getting a, a sort of holistic sense of the industry. If I thought this is where I'm going to spend the next 30, 40 years, I need to know what I'm getting into. Um, and I came to the conclusion that I'd probably really enjoy sales or business development, partnerships type work, structuring deals, um, that kind of thing. But then I discovered consulting. So I didn't even know about management consulting. I, I've i always studied science. And I actually, I wanted to say this earlier. I mean, I went into science because I think my parents encouraged it as well. They, For example, like I, I didn't grow up in a family with people working in business or finance. My parents are working class. Um, if anything, they were, you know, my dad would be kind of like, suspicious of like business and finance he's like oh yeah these people are just like you know taking your money and <laughs> making things expensive like they're, they're the bad guys um so that's the mentality i i kind of grew up with almost where science is a very noble thing you know you're generating knowledge you're doing something good it's it's prestigious you know it's somewhat well paid <laughs> um so so that's maybe why i was pushed in that direction um or at least sort of prodded encouraged to go in that direction but it wasn't until I started doing this deep dive a couple of years ago into biopharma that I started paying attention to business. So I had friends who studied business in, in university and I would make fun of them, you know, joke around being like, oh, you guys should do something useful, you know, study science or engineering, build something, you know, don't just be a parasite moving money around. <laughs> and, you know, just joking around, of course. Um, so I didn't know about consulting at all. Like I, I didn't realize that these were the jobs that all my friends who studied finance were trying to get out of out of their undergraduate degrees. My, I'm, I'm smiling because my podcast is mostly about entrepreneurship and investing in deep, yeah, deep yeah. areas. <laughs> Well, it's it's funny because then I I got really interested in this topic. Uh, one, I realized that management consulting salaries would be the highest out of a PhD of basically any job that I could potentially get. So I thought I need to get this. And and I also um, 
I and, you also, and you also get a high workload with management consulting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and scientists are used to that. You know? but, uh, so it's like, if we're going to be working long hours and, and doing really hard stuff all the time, might as well get paid a lot for it, was kind of my mentality. But this this exploration of uh, of the business world, initially through biopharma, about two years ago now, got me very interested in, in business and finance and learning about capital markets, things that I never had exposure to before. And I realized there were some tractable problems, uh, at least more tractable than the problems I was thinking about in science that are highly valued. People will give you money if you solve these problems. And at that point in my life, at this point in my life, uh, that started to become priority, thinking about starting a family, all these things, the, the thought of making mi basically minimum wage as a postdoc for five years to maybe get an academic career didn't seem as appealing anymore when I could be doing fun, engaging work elsewhere. Um, but yeah, by trying to understand how the biopharma industry worked, I started trying to understand just how businesses work in general and how they make their decisions. And I thought consulting would be a great fit. Started, you know, opened a brokerage account, started doing a little bit of a little bit of stock trading. You know, the GameStop thing was happening at the time. So I was obviously on the computer all day on Reddit and, and on Twitter all day because it was a COVID lockdown. Um, so I'm following that and trying to understand how short positions work and just getting into it. Um, so two years ago, the consulting interviews didn't work out. Um, and they they basically said, you've you have a good CV and you've done some cool stuff. I, I ran the university road racing club for four years. I'm, I'm a cyclist. Um, other extracurricular achievements and my academic CV, I think, is, is great for my stage of career. Uh, but they said, get some work experience and then reapply because we think you'd be great. But, you know. <laughs> we only McKinsey only hires like five people at this level for the Toronto office per year. It's competitive. I get that. That's so I, I had uh, I had I had by then already kind of realized that entrepreneurship is what I was interested in, um, and that consulting or any other business job would be a stepping stone to that for when I had the idea that I was ready to throw my weight behind and ready to to commit to because I believed in it. And it's because I realized that an uh, academic career and entrepreneurship are actually very, very similar. Like in, in both situations, you're basically selling ideas and convincing people to give you money to work on those ideas and convincing people to join your team and work on those things with you. Um, and when I realized those parallels, that's, that's a big part of what drew me to academia. It's that sort of sense of ownership and creation. Um, just with a different, you know, the the upside has a very different shape in the two <laughs> examples I'm giving. Um, so so I, I was thinking and learning about entrepreneurship and because I was learning about business strategy, of course, I started learning a lot about tech strategy and continuing to learn about biopharma, thinking, okay, maybe I could get a job in biotech VC or something on the buy side with my technical background and sort of uh, growing knowledge of, of how business works. Um, I mean... I understand the, the motivation to have um, to look at a postdoc career, which is not uh, make, not providing a lot of money and capital, but a lot of work in labs. And uh, usually uh, labs are not the place where you meet new people. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's more <laughs> small group, rather restricted. And I mean, when people want to make money, uh, blockchain is basically uh, one of those topics people come across. Um, I mean, I have a business background, so it was quite natural 10 years ago that I read about it in uh, stock market magazines. Mm -hmm. How did you find um, blockchain technology in a lab? I mean, science usually is not something that's very well connected to the finance world. What brought you into the uh glorious space of web-free blockchain technology and all the nice passwords that we heard in the last five years. <laughs> yeah. So, so it definitely, uh, wasn't, wasn't something I discovered by being in the lab. It was, you know, the next step of this COVID lockdown career exploration story, which was tech strategy is something that you read a lot about, um, just because it's it's a big industry. Uh, and so I'm following these accounts on Twitter. I'm following newsletters, like Not Boring by Packy McCormick, sort of business strategy, but not boring. Great, great newsletter. Uh, and 
I was getting excited about those topics. And one of the topics that was being covered was, was crypto and Web3 and blockchains, which it's funny because I had actually read about Bitcoin mining in 2010, long time ago. I was in high school still. And I told my friends about it and we're all like, oh, this seems, this seems kind of cool, but we never paid much attention. And then university and I'm studying science and grad school. And even in 2017, when there was like the, the last bull, bull market for crypto, um, I had friends who were doing some mining and getting into it, but I was focused on science. I thought this is cool, but you know, I don't have time for this. Uh, so it wasn't until I was sitting at home during lockdowns, spending way too much time on Twitter that I, I started exploring crypto and trying to understand why, you know, why the, the price was going up and to the right, <laughs> why the chart was, was looking really good. And, uh, I even had put a little bit like $500 into Ethereum and it, it tripled, I think, um, it made up for all my my bad stock picks in the traditional equity markets, and uh, and and it was just I, I sort of started going down the rabbit hole because, like I said, I was already thinking about entrepreneurship and ways that we could improve science because there are reasons why I decided to leave academia beyond the personal reasons, just structural systemic issues with how science happens both in academia and in industry that led me down this path over the last couple of years and. Uh, just learning about new technology. But, so, sorry, so, uh, apologies yeah. for interrupting. Uh, but there is not, in my opinion, I also discussed this with Paul Kohlhaus a few years ago. There is no logical uh, link between, my opinion, in between blockchain and, and, and science. How did you, in, in your mind, yeah. how did you bring these two topics together? Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think now i think there are ways we can talk about them where where there are some important links but just thinking about blockchain as a as a computing platform basically it's a it's an it's the next evolution of the internet is is how i like to talk about it and i will say scientists are very skeptical of crypto i mean they're not generally interested in finance or business or money you know you don't go into science for money so when you hear about crypto there's a lot of negative associations with it scams and people losing money and and all those hacks all this stuff right um, so if you say crypto to most scientists, they kind of recoil. They're like, Ugh, no, not interested. Um, but if you start talking about the the qualities of a distributed ledger and an immutable ledger and better ways of of keeping track of data and, and coordinating people, then you can maybe get their attention. And that's really where I think the connection is. This is just, I mean, a blockchain provides a a single source of truth that is undisputed, you know, the, the, there are consensus mechanisms and, and game theory and economics underlying this network of computers and this shared database that basically guarantees that the numbers there are correct, um, thus removing the need for intermediaries or centralized databases. And that's just a, it, you know, as I went down the rabbit hole, I realized through reading just a bunch of stuff that, that uh, there's like interesting philosophical arguments for, for, Crypto. And when I say crypto, I mean blockchain technology, Web3, all the same thing. Cryptocurrencies are just, I think, the first use case of blockchains that have reached some sort of market adoption, but but there will be more for sure, because it's more we'll to that in a second. But I mean, basically, by removing this need for, for a centralized intermediary, um, you solve coordination problems, like you solve the Byzantine generals problem. Like there's all these, all these, it's fundamentally different technology because you don't need to rely on trusting somebody. You can do things trustlessly, which is it's a bit of like a, a shift. And I'm still wrapping my head around it, but it, it changes how you think about things. And I mean, within financial services, for example, I think it's inevitable that blockchains, crypto, what have you, will replace a lot of the industry in time because it's just a more efficient way of doing things. It's like it's capitalism. Let's decrease transaction costs and increase efficiency um, and make it easier because now if you can use smart contracts say on ethereum to to automate a lot of processes and and guarantee that they will work as they're supposed to say in financial services you can you can basically write code or write protocols that will replace entire cost centers of people manually doing things and processing stuff i mean we see things like ave automated loan platform it's anybody can go and deposit their crypto and take a loan in crypto in usdc and then take that USDC and get it into their bank account without talking to a single person. It's all based on the code, which is, it's, again, coming into this later in my sort of professional development, I'm 30 years old now, 
I think there's a lot of possibilities that I haven't thought of. And, and this is why I'm so excited about the space because there are so many use cases. So I was thinking about use cases for this in science. Um, but but more importantly, I was uh, I was really just starting to think, OK, uh, I can talk about what experience I was getting as I was you know, two years ago after I got the consulting rejections. But I was spending a bit of time thinking about the problems in science, like funding. How do we get more money into science? Because if we had more money in science, we would we would have more scientists and we would have more discoveries and people like me wouldn't want to leave science to do something else. Um, so I thought, okay, how do we solve that problem? Um, maybe there are new investment syndicate models that would be cool to, to bring more money to biotech, uh, like venture capital, um, to support more early stage translational projects, for example. Um, maybe there's something else. So I'm just sort of thinking of these ideas and starting to talk to friends who are in tech and who are pursuing entrepreneurial pursuits um, and trying to think about that because I thought, okay, maybe if I come up with a good idea during my PhD, I can, I can try starting a company during my PhD. Crazy, but maybe it's possible. Um, if that's the end game, you know, somebody said, well, if that's what you want to do eventually, why don't you just do it now? You don't need to go work in consulting and burn yourself out for a few years before you do that. I mean, I, I thought maybe I, I do because it'd be good to have some money, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about these ideas and, and at the same time, learning more about crypto. And uh, this is, I, I actually like, I was very interested in, in the topic of DAOs, DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. And this is what really, I think, drew me into crypto because I, I don't have a super strong finance background. So all the DeFi, decentralized finance stuff was not immediately clear to me, intuitive, but this way of organizing people through blockchains and, and these sort of like shared systems uh, that are that can be permissionless through DAOs, that got me really excited because I, I started thinking, okay, this is a, this is like the future of how people will work. This is how, you know, companies, this will be the back end for companies one day. I mean, um, I'm curious about your perspective. I mean, I have a finance background and when uh, also in 2010, I came across uh, Bitcoin, I got an email back then and they were not talking specifically about Bitcoin. I couldn't remember Bitcoin. There was this mail who said, uh, you can buy token now. And, um, it was on uh, one of my public accounts yeah. and I was very much into gaming back then. Um, I mean, I grew up with computers, basically. I'm now close to 50 years old. And my first question was when I read token and token was usually this, this term that uh, when the gaming industry discovered the internet and brought the computer games online, uh, mm -hmm. you could buy a token in game and could use this token to purchase some, uh, some items for your character in the game yeah, yeah. and this is what they associated with this uh, term token and my first question was what can i buy with it and the reply was nothing <laughs> you can buy token and <laughs> so, yeah it's useless and it took yeah. me a few years it was in 2017 when there was always this hype around bitcoin and they always thought yeah but it's code and you can copy and paste it and you can easily create other tokens so i didn't see a unique selling proposition for bitcoin it's code you copy it you make another blockchain you have mm -hmm. it and i thought there will be millions of thousands of blockchains which we have right now so mm -hmm. why should this appreciate why should the value appreciate and why should it yeah become totally. more valuable and then there was this 2013 hype i didn't buy anything and in 2017 it got me curious about what, what is it i mean more and more people buy bitcoin for what reason and slowly understood that you can, it, it's a transaction protocol, basically. And one of the problems in, in finance is how can you automate transactions? Mm -hmm. When I look back in the 80s, everything was paper. Uh, so one person gave money on paper, got a receipt on paper, and a lot of paperwork. And this was very slow and expensive. You needed a lot of people and verification processes. And with Bitcoin, I understood it might not be the best solution. It might not be the fastest. It might not uh, be the one where you can really do millions of transactions in a second. Uh, it's rather slow. But for big corporations, when they transfer billions, you don't need a bank in between. You have the protocol. And this replaces... Uh, an entire system, especially in areas where it's difficult to maintain banks or where people with sky, I mean, with, with Elon Musk Skylink, they can basically plug into the internet anywhere in the world. But uh, opening 
a bank subsidiary in the middle of the jungle might be difficult. So no transaction possibility there in the jungle. Um, this opened a lot of ideas. Then I started working in uh, in science or with scientists, helping them to understand the business world. And never it never occurred to me that there were any use cases with blockchain technology in science. Uh, yeah. Can you help the listeners of the podcast understand uh, how blockchain technology can improve science? Yeah, I mean, where to begin? So I guess I, I'll start with let's let's talk about DeSci. I guess that was the the topic of today's conversation. I've just been rambling on about myself, but uh, I mean, decentralized science is is basically the idea of using blockchain technology, Web three, to improve how we do science and to improve the systems of science. And I like to to my mental model is I have a few different buckets that I would break DSI into, and they each address different issues within the world of science. Um, so we can start with funding. Of course, funding is a major problem. I mean, there's the question of how do we get more funding to science? There's a question of how do we most efficiently allocate this capital? Um, how do we decide who gets grants? How do we make this fair? How do we create more opportunities? That's for maybe basic research. And then on the translational side, you know, how do you make investment decisions? How do you decide which which scientists should be funded to try to start companies. Um, how do you de-risk that? I mean, biotech, one thing in all my exploration was discovering that I didn't really enjoy the biotech business model that much. So if I wanted to start a company, it would be, it would be a tech company. Um, even though, you know, despite my passion for the topic, I just thought super long, you know, uh, time to any sort of liquidity event. And Alex, uh, <laughs> risk model. I think that the most the most funny term uh, brought another guest from my podcast, Alex Sabaronkov. He always says it's uh, a molecular casino. <laughs> so basically, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a molecular casino, and and it's so capital intensive and so high risk. And uh, and that just I thought, okay, I don't know if that's something I'd want to do. Hence the thinking about tech ideas. Um, but I mean, how do we how do we fix those problems, right? So so funding is one is the first bucket. Um, the other two would be uh, publishing. So publishing is a very, well, I wouldn't say necessarily very broken system, but it's, it is, it has a lot of problems. I mean, um, there's, for, for non-scientists who are listening, I mean, scientific publishing is kind of crazy. Like the industry has some of the highest margins, maybe the highest margins of any industry in the world, uh, because how it works is the scientists do the research and then they pay money to publish the article. <laughs> the peer reviewers are not paid. They basically volunteer their time for the journal. And then once it's peer reviewed and published, readers are paying or their universities are paying or their libraries paying to access the article. So it's this triple payer model where these, these industries are like, well, the, the publishers are essentially just capturing tremendous amounts of value uh, that I think, for example, should be better distributed to the people doing the work. Um, since since they publish on the internet, it's uh, becoming lucrative. But before it was ba yes. basically paper, so I think everything exactly. was consumed yeah, yeah. with paper. Then came so, the internet, and the profit and margins no, simply no. skyrocketed. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And they've, and I mean, these there's sort of three major publishers, and they've slowly grown over the years through acquisitions. Um, and they're they are old businesses. Like the their roots are are you know oh, some of these are over hundred years old, and and families even I think elsewhere. Still to a family. Fair, <laughs> to be fair to the channel, what they deal back his reputation. So, for example, Nature, when a scientist uh, gets accepted into Nature, peer reviewed, uh, I think it pushes the reputation of the scientists. Definitely, uh, and up the ladder. And this is one of those things where we're thinking about open access and and uh, open science and open source. You know, even if you really believe in this being being important. You know, I'm, I'm not going to choose to publish in some smaller journal over nature. If I have the opportunity to publish in nature, I will pay the money because the reputation is important. Um, and this may be a good time to, to mention without going on about the issues around publishing for too long. Uh, but the, uh, the decentralized science movement that is emerging today really builds on the open science movement, which predates it by, by decades. Um, and the open science movement is essentially this movement that that says we should open up science. Things should be open source and more collaborative um, and less closed. And it has succeeded in some ways, but but not really. Like the the vision of open science has not really uh, come to fruition yet. So DSI is kind of the next iteration of this. And I think 
maybe it has a chance to succeed because of the technology that we're trying to use as a stack for all of this, for all these, all these solutions for problems that affect the world of science. And science is, it's important, right? It, it's what lets humanity progress. It's the generation of new knowledge. Um, so ultimately, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about making science better and using this technology, blockchain technology, to build tools and systems that'll help us do more science, fund more science. Um, you know, the future I want to live in is one where everybody wants to be a scientist and has the opportunity to be a scientist if that's what they want to do. Because um, I think the world would be a better place that way. And and I sort of reframed my my raison d'etre uh, for for like career from trying to make discoveries to make a better, you know, to make a better world to trying to, you know, have more science in the world in general, which was always my long term interest, you know, sort of science administration and and trying to recruit the best people and and be an advocate for science. Um, but I, again, realized that maybe this can be better done through the world of, of business uh, than through academia. So so that's the first two buckets, funding and publishing. And then the last would be, I think, just generally reputation and attribution. Um, and these are all, of course, very interlinked. But if you just zoom back out to blockchain technology, you know, having a, a, a shared source of truth about your contributions that are verifiable, I think this opens up a lot of possibilities, right? Like um, somebody, for example, wins a Nobel Prize and they win the Nobel Prize and they're recognized for it, but there's there's dozens, if not hundreds of people who have contributed to that work over time. And right now the, uh, the record of that is just some broken non-machine readable citation tree over hundreds of different journals over decades. But if this is all, some sort of shared repository, um, again, with verifiable credentials, and there's all this sort of digital identity, decentralized identity that ties into this, we, we start to have possibilities where maybe this person gets a Nobel Prize, and they are paid out some amount, but permissionlessly, everyone who contributed to this work also gets some reward. It's this sort of retroactive reward, where if you think, yeah, I, I might not be in charge of this lab, but the guy I work for is brilliant, and I think He's going to win a Nobel Prize one day, and you know I will be entitled to some part of that permissionlessly airdropped to me as token. Yeah, sure. <laughs> In like, like, or... like, like, like a comp like a computer game. I mean, when you think about it, I uh, <laughs> currently read the book "The Innovators" from Walter Isaacson. I mean, it's not about molecular genetics; it's more about the origin of the internet and the digital revolution, and he touched a lot this open science movement, especially in the 50s, 60s, which played an integral part of the of the way how the internet developed. And I thought while I was reading that, I thought, I mean, when you think about it, all the scientific systems that we work right now, when we look at funding, when we look at uh, publishing, what you mentioned, and reputation, uh, attribution or patents, uh, the origin is basically 1800, 1700, 1600, 1900, something at best. And yeah. we are now in 2023 with a completely different landscape of technology. And what I would like to understand and, and use your know-how because uh, you are closer to science than I am and uh, you're also familiar with the decentralized science movement. Uh, maybe we can dive deeper into your three buckets and brainstorm a little bit how decentralized science or blockchain technology can help fix the problem. You mentioned the first bucket, funding. What perspective do you see with blockchain technology to remodel funding for scientists? Totally. Um, so, so there's let's let's start by breaking this into two two parts. There is, um, I have one more thing to just say about blockchain and cryptos, and and it is just basically that it is it is social coordination technology. It's social technology like money. It lets people interact and do things with each other. A lot of these problems in science are are social problems. I just I personally am most interested in the funding part That's because I think, I think, well, yeah, it's cultural inefficiencies. It's it's uh, being okay with the status quo because it works fine and scientists would rather do science, right? Um, but but when you have technology that lets you build economic incentives or reputational incentives, code, you know, like that's that's really what it is. It's, it's all about creating incentives. It always comes down to incentives and crypto is technology that lets you engineer incentives and, and guarantee or at least you know do some game theory so people do the thing you want them to do um, because it'll benefit them so that's kind of what 
got me very excited about crypto, the coordination and the incentive mechanism design. Um, so when we think about how we how we can fix things in science and think about incentives, two funding problems are there. There's basic research and then applied or translational stuff, stuff that can be patented and can have IP. Um, so let's start with that side. I, I think this is the area within DSI that maybe has the most attention um, and has been having the biggest impact so far. Um, and this is essentially biotech and blockchain meeting together. Um, and the last time you had someone talking on DSI, that was Paul Kolhas. And Paul is Paul's great. I, I love Paul. He is somebody who really inspired me as I was going, getting into this about two years ago. Um, he's the co-founder of Molecule. And what they do is they are basically creating technology to hopefully improve the biotech, biopharma industry around IP and patents. So we start with this idea of a, of a IP NFT, intellectual property, non-fungible token, or just IP tokens in general. Um, and there's a lot of legal engineering that happens behind here, but they've created this, this protocol, uh, NFT-based protocol, and then now other token-based protocol to pretty much wrap intellectual property and all the legal stuff behind that into this digital token so then you can fractionalize it and, and solve problems like the extreme inefficiency in pricing and you know how opaque pricing is in the biopharma industry. Um, the entire IP asset class is very well performing, I hear, but it's really illiquid and, and there's a lot of information asymmetry. And it's just a very inefficient market. So, so I think Paul and his co-founder Tyler and the great team that they've built, they went in trying to solve this problem because they were passionate about, about helping the biopharm industry get more drugs into the market to solve more problems, to cure more diseases at a much lower cost because it's very, very, very expensive um, and risky. So that's what I was most interested in at the time. And as I was going, getting into DSI, and I can talk about how I got into DSI later, uh, I saw the work that they were doing and had been doing and watched talks that they had given in you know 2018 and 2019 on the topic. And I was like, wow, these guys are thinking of the same problems that I've been thinking about. And they have a really cool way to, to potentially solve it. Um, but can, and, can, can, can yeah. you stop here? You said problems. Uh, define the problem. The problem, uh, maybe just... Like I said, the the uh, high risk and the high uh, cost of capital to do biotech um, was just one of them. You know, how do we just get more money here? How do we de-risk it more? How do we uh, create incentives for people to do this kind of risky work? You know, and to to take bets on this, whether as a scientist or an investor um, or other operator within the company, um, how do we make people care about this this more? Right, and I think. Giving you know more people, retail investors, people who who trade crypto exposure to these assets is is an interesting idea um, that could bring more money into the market and and more exposure and appreciation to the work being done. Um, so so yeah, I mean through Molecule they've launched Vita DAO, which is a longevity biotech funding DAO, which is you know they've been really successful. They they launched a token which governs the DAO, which has people who decide where they're investing. Uh, their their funds. They've distributed a few million, I think, in investments already. And uh, I don't know if they're doing grants, but basically, you know, a researcher will get some money to do this, basically a sponsored research agreement, and they uh, receive an IP NFT, or rather, they sort of issue an IP NFT to VitaDAO um, in exchange for funding. And now this IP NFT is cool because it can be fractionalized and used to raise more money. For more experiments, so say there's some nice. Are results. you are you are you, fam, are, are you familiar with the VitaDAO mechanism uh, in detail? Uh, fairly well, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe I, maybe I, we, maybe yeah. maybe we dive a little bit deeper in this area to help. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, we have a lot of uh, investors, entrepreneurs who are not yeah. familiar with uh, basically this technology, and yeah. maybe they might be interested. Um, I mean, from what you said, I understood that. From VitaDAO, the researcher, the scientist, uh, in basic research, basically, we're talking about basic research, um, who wants to do a specific study, a specific experiment, whatever, uh, can apply for a grant from VitaDAO, and he or she gets money for doing the research. So VitaDAO is more interested in translational stuff. They really want to come, they want to fund things that will cure aging okay. ultimately. So it's basically uh, one step one step behind in the value chain. So not basic research. So when, mm -hmm. a, when a scientist say, okay, I mean, 
uh, like you, for example. Um, 99% of my work is nice. I have nice publications. I'm ready to get the Nobel Prize, but uh, it will never end up in a product. But there's this 1%. I have this one idea. This might translate, but I like funding. So this yeah. would be the basic exactly. use case. And yeah. Vita Tao is another possibility to apply for funding for translational research. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they are sort of like an investment. They're almost like a biotech VC, but a DAO which is really cool. So people can get involved and earn their way and, and contribute and share in the upside. Because but, the but, but what, what I didn't understand, also when I spoke with Paul, what I didn't understand, what's the difference between VC? I mean, VC is doing pretty much the same or a business angel or a angel syndicate or yeah. the European Union or all these grant organizations that we have mm -hmm. here in Europe. And I think you have similar grant organizations, foundations who help with translational research. What makes Vita Tao unique in that space mm -hmm. compared to the others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they've they've also gone on to launch other bio DAOs focusing on other areas like hair loss, women's health. Um, but Vita Dao is the first one, and I guess the most successful so far. It's gotten the most funding. They have a they got an investment from Pfizer Ventures, I believe, of or Sanofi Ventures. It's they're they're doing some really big things. And here's so the difference. It's, so, it's, so it's basically recognized by the but by Pfizer, so it's a big pharma company. It's not uh, where you have some, let's say, some some yeah. people who accidentally made some money during uh, reading Reddit with GameStop and then say, okay, yeah, let's yeah. create a DAO. So you have serious participants. It's, it's, yeah, and it's I'm pretty sure it's Sanofi. I, I said Pfizer initially, but I'm pretty sure it's Sanofi. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like, this is a really crazy thing. And, uh, yeah, if you look up Vita DAO um, partnership, you'll, you'll find something. So... And again, this is me as, as an outsider. I've never really been involved with Vita Dao. I just know a lot of the people who are involved and who are running it. And I've I've read, you know, all their stuff and uh, I have a lot of respect for, for the entire project. So, I mean, Vita Dao, what makes it different from just a traditional biotech VC is that it is really, it's a community of people who care a lot about this topic. There's some people who are working for the Dao and, and, and getting paid to do this work. But there's a lot of people in the community who just care a lot about longevity and want to see this succeed and are excited to support this and to maybe provide their expertise in exchange for something, right? So it's like, if you have all, the most passionate people, uh, the people who are most passionate about longevity, all sort of working together for this shared organization that they're all a part of through ownership of tokens that give you governance rights on chain, guaranteed through smart contracts, uh, to the future of this organization, uh, this helps create incentives for people, for the right people to contribute, right? If you're a biotech VC and you're you're doing due diligence on, on some longevity potential company, you don't know anything about longevity. You know, you can maybe hire an expert or talk to a friend, but but it's difficult to access that expertise. And, and here we have a community of, of scientists and investors and and people who care about longevity who are focusing their knowledge and talent to place really good bets in this domain um because they have the incentive to do this they're not just getting paid you know a uh, hundred bucks an hour to like review some stuff for some vc fund they share in the ownership of this community and this organization that's doing this work and making these investments and pushing the field forward um and i think that's very powerful it's like the ownership economy that that web3 enables that uh, is a good example here. So, um, I mean, biopharma is a big industry, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot of product market fit between DSI and biotech. I mean, Molecule, I think, did a $12 million uh, funding round. Um, I just five found, ventures. Yeah, there we go. Has a ventures, Apollo Health Ventures, Shine Capital. So Shine is also a larger uh, company, larger player. And I saw it, um, th there were some, I clicked for some sites and I saw also that uh, basically everybody with a PayPal account can also contribute and, and buy some token and participate. Yep. So they exactly. basically, yeah. they basically can unite the big players in the market for translational research, for high risk research, basically. Mm -hmm. But also everybody with a PayPal account can also make a donation. Totally. And I will I will say also, I mean, um, we, I, you know, I could probably go on about just via DAO and molecule and all that stuff for you know hours i, I think i mean I, yeah. I, I think it makes a nice use case to to help people understand yeah what yeah. we are talking about but because when it when, when i when i think about stars and what what is DAO? what 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 makes yeah, it unique? yeah exactly why why like why even have a DAO to do this right like why not do a company and i think that's DAOs are still an experiment by and large like within within web3 and crypto um 
but there there's this idea of, of shared ownership that I think is very powerful that creates new possibilities. It's just new ways of organizing people to do work, right? It's almost like things can be more equitable and more transparent um, than in traditional structures. So basically compared to a VC, a VC collects money from institutional investors and usually doesn't go into translational research. A VC usually invests in uh, companies who uh, that are further down the road towards yeah. the market. Yeah. And yeah. The translational research is basically a complete mess. It's a mixture of grants, some high net worth individuals who play casino. Um, VCs don't touch it. And it's very complicated. And without, it's basically a, legal, a new legal structure where you can pool money and distribute the capital to scientists for the research. Um, and what you get back then is basically a participation in an NFT at the end of the day. So when the scientist produces his yeah. research results, it's minted on an NFT. I mean, that's that's one way to look at it. So I think let me let me take a step back and just sort of correct some small things there, right? Like basically, this organization Vita DAO, um, it is governed by token holders. Anyone can be a token holder and vote on their governance. You can go on Uniswap and and get Vita tokens, have them in your in your wallet and be part of VitaDAO. Um, VitaDAO basically wants to grow a treasury of valuable IP because they would like to, you know, have the token go up in value. And if the treasury governed by the token uh, gets bigger, then the token is more valuable because it it isn't, you know, for legal reasons and securities laws reasons, you maybe don't say that this entitles you to the X percent of the company, but it gives you governance rights over the organization that controls this treasury. And there's all sorts of things in place to make this a protocol and, and be less uh, less re reliant on trust. Um, so people can feel more assured that, you know, this is legit, basically. It's all it's all transparent. It's all in the open. Um, so these researchers getting getting this funding and doing research and getting results and generating IP that VitaDAO hopes will be valuable. But now they have a token that represents the rights to that IP. And that token can be fractionalized. So say they, you know, say they have given some lab $100,000 and they get some really exciting preliminary results and they need, you know, half a million to do the next step of results if they think this might be a good preclinical candidate or something. Maybe now VitaDAO says, okay, we're going to sell 10% of this, of this token for $500,000, um, giving this IP a $5 million valuation or something, right? They get that money. They do more research. The value of that IP goes up they fractionalize more of it, sell more fractions, and get more money to do more research. And hopefully, eventually, this this leads to a drug that helps people. Um, I mean, like, I, don't, I mean, yeah. I mean uh, for what I understand, one of the big problems in in the industry is, and uh, it's really a problem when I, as a business angel, so I'm not a billionaire, basically. Um, a billionaire can play an easy game. When they, when they see something, let's take BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine was funded by a family office before the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. When you have a few billions, you can easily bet 100 million. Elon Musk, for example, I mean, he has, I think his net worth was close to 200 billion at the top of the bubble. Now it might be 150, 140, 130 something. When he takes 100 million, sells some shares from Tesla, doesn't harm his uh, uh, his share price at Tesla, and yep. he invests in bringing the next molecule in the casino forward. Uh, it doesn't hurt him when he loses it. When someone with a net worth of two or three hundred thousand euros or a million or fifty thousand euros wants to support a scientist and invests ten thousand, uh, it's basically saying goodbye to the money forever. Because how this uh, VC world then works, if the experiment functions, works, produces positive results, and it's ended up in a company, no VC is paying back to business angels. No VC, in, not the early stage VCs. Yeah? No VC is uh, paying out early stage funds. And this is the illusion that they get from new players in the field all the time. They say, okay, when I invest 4 million in that project, 
Uh, I can do a secondary transaction with VVC and I say, no way, I'm not 17 years in this industry and this doesn't just happen with uh, DVCs. DVCs put money down to move the project forward, but not to pay out the early investors. So what they want to see is when they put 4 million down, it's not 4 million going back to the first investors, it's 4 million going back into progress, into yep. growing that. And what I understood from VitaDAO, I just looked it up at CoinMarketCap, Mm -hmm. They have a dog. So basically the decision model for a business angel then is, let's say, business angel, 50,000 euros, free capital to invest in science. He can decide to either say goodbye to the money, invest in a company directly or buy VitaDAO. Yep. Basically. Get exposure to this basket of IP that they're trying to grow by by making these it's investments. And VitaDAO, the management of VitaDAO must take care of getting more IP into the basket on one hand. And on the other hand, trans, uh, selling uh, the the, uh, the generated IP to mm -hmm. subsequent partners or license it into life science companies. But the, the, huge, the huge difference is that it becomes liquid for the small investors. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to wait basically 20 years or 10 years uh, yeah. or have this 99% uh, failure risk, or above 99% when they support early stage research. Uh, whenever they want, they can sell the beta DAO. Maybe they have a loss because it just you can you can just so show it to share the screen. So maybe they bought it here and can sell it then there and say, okay, I'm out a year later, or I stay in longer, or I buy buy back in. But it uh, increases the chance for small investors to have a liquid asset class instead of being part of an illiquid asset class. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's there's all sorts of questions and conversations to be had around retail investors and how to protect them and everything. But I think giving more participants the ability to to be involved in this sort of market is ultimately better, right? Especially we're talking about drug development and creating cures for diseases here. It's like, I think more money coming into the system is better and this is how it snowballs and you get more institutions it's, sorry so, so sorry for interruption but this is my field of work basically yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. for 17 years uh i mean not only not only retail investors it's also um funds that are financed by tax money I very often heard or had conversations with fund managers who say okay we got 40 million we invested in that project 4 million already and when we sign off a license deal, we want the investment back. And this is where always where I say, I'm not aware of any venture capital firm who puts a series A 10 million down and says 4 million go go back to the to the investors yeah. before. Uh, they want to see the 10 million at work. So also for this kind of funds, for this uh, public money that goes into, uh, it gives also the taxpayer the potential to participate on the upside. When you look on the other side, grant money, I mean, grant money is nice, but it's basically yeah. non-repayable. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, maybe there's some way we can uh, we can change that using using DSI. Hopefully, if <laughs> we talk about grants and uh, and public goods funding for basic research. But yeah, no, I, I I'm aware of your background, which is why I'm happy to just go on about this uh, application of DSI to biotech. Because I think there's there's a nice fit there. I mean, just uh, as people talk about real world assets being brought on chain, whether that's real estate or mortgage bonds, um, treasury bills. I think another interesting area that we'll probably see movement in, maybe not in the next year, but sometime in the future, uh, is is other IP assets that are already existing that are not just newly generated, but just represented as tokens on chain, um, just to give investors exposure to different asset classes, different uncorrelated assets with more liquidity. Um, like instead of investing in a biotech company, you can invest in a bucket of IP and the royalties that are associated with that IP, for example, um, this was this was my mistake with uh, that I had in the conversation with Paul. I always was thinking in uh, one project, one company, mm -hmm. but with the addition of it's a basket of IP basically, yeah. And the team of such a structure like Vita Tau, it can also be others. Uh, it's just an example that's here. Um, then have to take care to license the IP. And yeah. the the fund or the, the the grant organization or the retail investor 
doesn't have to do any work with that. Also not the scientists. So it's the it's the function of the management team. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really decentralized at the end of the day because you need a team working for that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they can work on making the basket more valuable with signing yep. off uh, deals constantly. So they can yep. constantly yep. negotiate on the market. Totally. And, and if you're a scientist who knows the specific topic, you know, you could have a strong incentive to get involved and lend your expertise because you might be able to make a, a measurable impact on the value of this token by contributing your knowledge and you'll get paid in Vita tokens for there's, your contributions, you know? <laughs> there's now one question that pops up in my mind. You mentioned also reputa reputation and you brought this Nobel Prize example, mm -hmm. but this is also, I think, a problem, a huge problem with... Um, with any scientific study that we have, is there a mechanism in 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 Vita DAO that makes sure that uh, the scientists who were responsible for the studies that produced the IP? Um, I mean, when when I, when I researched Ethereum, they always said, "Yeah, you can then, for example, a song, uh, you can mint in the NFT that the uh, artist always gets ten percent of the returns directly transferred to them." Do you see also this possibility for scientists when they opt for uh, a decentralized science model with a token involved? I, I hope so. I think I think again coming back to the the virtue. So we are we are not there yet. <laughs> We're not there yet. Yeah, but I mean it's it's very it's very related to this, right? I think um, so. There are projects like LabDAO, like DeSci Labs. Uh, it's a company, DeSci Labs. They uh, they're working on on the sort of publishing and, and generation of scientific knowledge problem, um, where. We can talk about some problems in science for a second. Um, if this is quite related to this. This is basically, you know, if you just put your results out as a preprint or something, it's not published, it's not peer reviewed, or just, you know, there's interesting new ideas for how we can publish science, like micro publications, um, which I think are important ways of maybe changing how we think of publishing a scientific story. I think, you know, this is open science stuff still. It's just like, why can't we just share small results and be getting recognition for that. Why do you have to spend many, many years putting together a big story to try to submit to self or science or, or nature? Um, it would be more efficient if we just more collaboratively share the bits and pieces. And, um, you know, the, the current token of scientific progress right now is a PDF. It's not machine readable. It's really outdated, um, which is really crazy. So that's, that's why projects like DSI Labs are building products to try to upgrade, you know, provide a, a sort of firmware upgrade for scientific publishing where all the data is linked and traceable like GitHub would be, um, but all on a decentralized storage network, IPFS, um, with incentives to guarantee that this will be maintained there. So that way you can trace who did everything and when, and you can reproducibly rerun the code that they used. Um, so that way you can have attribution and provenance over the results you've gotten. Um, LabDAO, so the project that I've been involved with in the past, they are creating infrastructure for for doing computational biology experiments in a decentralized way with the data being being minted as an nft on chain which is then the metadata of the nft points to where the original data is stored on ipfs on this decentralized network and it's really amazing because now you might generate a result and yes it's published out in the open but you have like verifiable proof that you generated this data at this specific date and time not somebody else. So even if somebody tries to publish it, you can say, hey, I did the experiment first and you could have seen it or you did see it or, or whatever. Um, and so it lets us think of new ways of, of basically doing science where we don't need to keep things closed off and hidden because yes, things are public, but we can prove when we did it and who did it and build up these identities around it, which maybe will give you, you know, an opportunity in the future. Um, or some cut of some some prize or some grant in the future, right? It's just like this whole scientific system, all the infrastructure for it is is it's very outdated, and there's not a lot of money going to it. Like the it's a very underserved industry in terms of technology. Um, and this is and it's again, and it's, and and it's and it's complicated. I mean, it's complicated <laughs> when yeah. when I think back to my conversations with larger institutions. Uh, science needs capital like everything in the world yeah. you need money to 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 high level science basically Definitely. and to generate money you have i mean these filters were always free filters so one is 
can you collaborate with somebody when someone wants to have a budget? When the answer is no, the chances of get any, getting any budgets is pretty much very low. But with collaboration comes the problem of prior art at the end of the day, because the next question is, can we patent it? Is, I mean, and patent yeah. is basically only uh, only important when there is a commercialization aspect involved. So when someone has some idea that this might someday end up in a product where somebody can sell something on the market, let's put it just generally. And of uh, course, the IP. <laughs> in, in, this, in this, you have a whole bunch of problems because you have a lot of legal contracts, a lot of legal work in between the collaborating parties to make sure that uh, nothing leaves a certain circle, no information leaves a certain circle, or nothing gets published before uh, the patent attorneys finish the work. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. And then with the patent question, if the patent question is not positive, then the third question is, can we publish it somewhere for more reputation? More reputation means more money further down the road. Yeah, and yeah. if I understood our conversation so far right, and maybe we can dig deeper into that, uh, DSI is about remodeling the entire patent system and publication system, basically. Uh, that's definitely part of DSI. I think. I think it's just it's creating better, better infrastructure for for doing all of this, right? And of course, adoption is a, is another big question. Um, coming back to Molecule, I mean, I think one of the really, really great things that they've been able to do is is all the sort of legal engineering that goes on behind the scenes between the tech transfer offices and universities and investors and whoever else is involved um, in the IP and in the rights to it. The legal engineering part is, is very non-trivial and getting everyone to agree that this NFT or these tokens will represent rights to the IP has been, has been like a, a hard thing to do. So they're developing the technology, but there's also mm -hmm. All the social stuff around it that's very but, important but but when you guys so solve the social stuff i mean the big problem that i see and i also discussed it with paul three years ago is still that uh when when something is successful it's not a problem it gets published and it gets patented and it gets public so everybody doing research in the same field gets access to the data the important part of the data so that they can look okay what was patented what was published how can I use it for my work uh, and when it's just research we don't have a problem with licensing anyways but due to this mechanic that we want to make money also with research when a study fails uh it doesn't get published and it doesn't get patented but yeah. nobody makes this information accessible because there's still hope yeah. So it's yeah. it's a very long process. So when you, you a study usually lasts some months or years, then you have the patent attorney is looking into it, and it takes another year, I would say, when, until the uh, uh, until the process is finished. Then you have uh, people looking into for the publication, and it's probably three or five years minimum mm -hmm. before anybody sees something from a study. So. A study that runs now is probably published in three to five years down the road. And the big question is always, can we make this accessible? All the failed studies, we have yeah. a lot of failed studies, a lot of data from failed studies that cannot be commercialized sitting around, but nobody distributes it because there is no incentive for it, but it would be valuable for scientists. Yeah. I, I this is this is one of the use cases that I've spent a bit of time thinking about and I'm very happy that you've arrived at it because because yeah I think again comes back to incentives if we can provide incentives through data markets or something um to publish and share and open source your failed results or your data in general I think that's very powerful for science right um if if you can prove that you did it first then it should be okay to share and anyone who wants to work on it can work with you uh through these through these sort of systems it's it's just so like i think I, I, I would add one point to what you said if you can prove that you did it first and the second is uh if you also can commercialize it if if it secures commercialization further down the road for the first yeah, party yeah. then maybe you should be entitled to that exactly so so that's the thing right like if you can create these these systems for incentives for publishing negative results, I think that could accelerate science for sure. And and also positive results earlier, not waiting five yeah, yeah. years, but <laughs> yeah, 
maybe yeah, six months or something, once you've analyzed it and you're happy to share the analysis and say, this is what we've done so far. You can rerun our code uh, on the data we collected. You know, let's work together. Or you can check that I did what I said I did. Um, and I don't know if we even have time to talk about the applications of like zero knowledge cryptography to machine learning, for example, being able to prove that specific code was run without showing the results or showing the code that was run, mm -hmm. but still be able to prove these things um, opens up a lot of very cool possibilities across anything in, involving data, really. But um, I mean, yeah. for, for, for the time we have, uh, I have time for half an hour, uh, half an hour eight, eight, 8 p.m. I, I should go. What would you like to focus on in the last half hour of our conversation? I, I let's see. So I want to I want to finish up the last uh, the other half of the whole public uh, not publishing but funding problem within science because I think uh, this is this is the area that I'm I've spent the most time thinking about uh, mm. within science. Um, and I think we'll have time for some other stuff. But we'll see where the conversation goes. I mean, we we spent a lot of time talking about this uh, the the sort of translational innovation engineering funding that may generate IP. Um, molecules doing great things. I was going to say, you, you mentioned these tech investors who are like, you know, entrepreneurs who have a lot of money who are now investing in different things. I think uh, VitaDAO has been successful because there are a lot of people in crypto who did make money, who care about longevity a lot, and they were excited to support something like this. Um, and that's great, right? It's like, if people care about this and they have the money to support something, let's make it easy for them to do this. Um, so it is kind of interesting where that, where, why the longevity stuff. I mean, why longevity is a separate conversation, and I think it's it's a very important thing to work towards curing. Um, let's end aging. You know, let's stop death. Of course, that's what we're all trying to do within within biopharma. Uh, so so yeah, that there's been a lot of focus on that because people can make money on it, right? There's an opportunity to make money. Um, but I like to also remember or, or bring to everyone's attention that there's also basic research which has no guaranteed financial return, right? There's no guaranteed return on investment for basic science. This is just knowledge being generated for humanity, for civilization. So um, this, this is what people would refer to as public goods, basically, or, or the public goods funding problem. How do we fund public goods equitably that uh, that takes into account the plurality of views and people within our society. Um, how do we basically use tax money for the things that people really care about and really want um, and the things that should be given money, right? So within within Web3, especially within the Ethereum ecosystem, there's a really big public goods funding movement, uh, which I've been involved in. And this is one of the things that like DAOs brought me into, it sort of made me think, oh yeah, there are really smart people working on really important problems within crypto. It's not just, you know, NFTs, scams, and, uh, you know, people gambling. And FTX. <laughs> yeah, it's not just that. It's like, there are people trying to solve these important social coordination problems using this technology. And they're starting within their ecosystem. So so Gitcoin is an organization that I worked with and, and ran. The uh, name is Git, Gitcoin. Gitcoin. Yeah, G-I-T. Not Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, so imagine GitHub and Bitcoin, Gitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, can, if we have time, I can, well, I, I can talk a little bit about Gitcoin. Um, but basically, they they are a, a DAO that creates tools for communities to fund their shared needs. So they do these quadratic funding grant rounds um, for things like the Ethereum infrastructure or open source software, Web three education. These are the different grant rounds that they've they've operated. They built these permissionless protocols to be able to do these grant rounds, almost like crowdfunding rounds, but with a twist. They use a mechanism called quadratic funding, which means that the number of votes or donations to a project um, has almost a bigger impact than the amount of donations they get when it comes to splitting up a shared pool of funds. So there's a matching pool, which gets allocated to all the projects in the grant round based on how many donations they get and how big those donations are. So that way, say as a toy example, Say there's a thousand dollars to be split up between two projects or three projects you know one project gets a thousand dollars from one donor the next project gets a thousand dollars from 10 donors the last project gets a thousand dollars from 100 donors the one with 100 donors who each gave ten dollars will get the lion's share of that matching pool because way more people support that specific thing and this sort of solves the one dollar one vote problem that we have in our in our society uh, to something more democratic, more equitable. 
Um, so they've been doing this for years, uh, and we've done a couple of decentralized science rounds to fund projects in the ecosystem, um, where based on the donations and the support projects get from the community, they get some amount of this matching pool. So, so Gitcoin is one of the big projects so within public goods funding. Realm. Basically, it's working. We are not talking about ideas and concepts. No, this is this is working. Yeah, okay. absolutely. We we distributed in the the first DCI round, which I wasn't involved in running. This was last September. Uh, there was half a million in funds distributed to over a hundred projects. I think um, we did a smaller round back in April because it was a beta test for the new uh, protocol, which runs all the donations stuff, uh, all on chain, you know, using crypto. Um, and it was about 90,000 in total distributed to projects. So there's 75,000 for a matching fund and then how, almost 12,000 for how, how, how do you collect the capital? I mean, I'm just thinking about foundation work. Uh, usually people gather donors uh, to, to dinners, charity dinners, or send some sales rep out to collect money. It's very expensive. It's very slow. Uh, yeah. How do you, with, with this uh, system that you mentioned before, mm. how do you collect capital? What is the process behind it? This is a great question. So, so from the individuals who are supporting projects, crowdfunding, uh, they just donate with crypto directly, you know, on their computer. And it's all permissionless. Gitcoin does not act as an intermediary. We provide the front end for this to happen, but but it's all happening on chain on Ethereum or other Ethereum like networks and rollups. It's really cool. Like so you donate directly to but the, the base, the base is Ethereum. It's the basis. Yeah, basic yeah. protocol okay exactly. but now it's been deployed on optimism um i think it's coming to arbitrum a uh, whole bunch of other networks because it's all evm theorem virtual machine compatible um but it's really amazing because you donate directly to these projects and all the data about the donations and the amount of the donations it's all recorded and indexed somewhere on chain and anybody can see this it's permissionless so you can see who made the donations and reward the people who donated to specific projects because you're happy to see that these addresses supported the things you support and you maybe want to invite them or give them access to a group chat. This is the whole thing about crypto. It's all it's all open, it's permissionless, it's composable. And that's the powerful thing because then Gitcoin basically has this matching fund, um, which they will allocate through the protocol based on the results. And you can you want to make sure there's no fraud because you don't want people making bots to uh, attack this and and make a hundred accounts to donate a dollar each to their favorite project. So we can steal more funding from the pool. So Gitcoin has this other product called Passport, which is an identity protocol to prove by connecting different social media accounts in an encrypted way that you are a unique individual. Um, so people don't Sybil attack this as, as we call it. So, so yeah, that, that matching pool is still, you know, somebody from Gitcoin or rather anybody running a grant round through the Allo protocol that Gitcoin has developed has to then hit these are the results, give it to these. But the actual distribution happens all on chain, on Ethereum, for example, or Optimism, um, permissionlessly, right? They don't, nobody needs to accept it. Now that matching pool still needs to come from somewhere. And this is the big challenge that uh, I I've saw and that I see at Gitcoin, which is basically that money comes from funding partners, donors, like foundations, or, or people who just want to be, you know, benefactors, philanthropic, efforts or companies that want to be associated with this protocol, they want to give back to the ecosystem they came through. I mean, uh, Gitcoin has facilitated over 50 million in funding being distributed to projects within Web3 over the last four years. And some 50, of these projects, 50, 50, 50, million. 50 million, yeah. It's Five zero. Yeah. It's, US, US dollars. US, yeah, yeah. Uh, and like, I think the it's, it's really amazing. I mean, some of the biggest projects in crypto started off as Gitcoin grantees, like Uniswap, for example. Like Uniswap hit a multi-billion dollar, I think, market cap at some point with their token. And they started off getting, they were just building a protocol for decentralized exchanges, um, liquidity pools and, and all that, right? Automated market making. And, and they were like, we need money to build this. And they became a, a DAO and a company and they've been super successful. But that early funding came from people donating to them through Gitcoin. Because say I only have $10 to donate, you can feel good that your donations will be matched by the matching pool and and lead to the projects you care about getting more funding even if you can only vote with one dollar or something you know so in principle if you understand your explanation um scientists can ask for grant funding via gitcoin and in principle to stay in the old world and make uh the yeah yeah it, it, gitcoin it's, it's a new funding model basically um 
I, I so right now I will clarify like we haven't been funding scientific projects through through Gitcoin. Um, I'm not currently working with the organization, but I'm still involved. And hopefully, if we do another DSI round, if we can get some matching funds for it, um, then we definitely will. But we're, we're funding projects within the DSI space, which are building tools and systems and, and things for DSI, less so actual science, because you still need due diligence to make sure that no scams get into the round. And, you know, we would need it. That's the scientific review problem then. Um, so we're still kind of funding the DSI ecosystem at this point. But anybody could use the tools Gitcoin has has built to do these grant rounds, and they could run their own grant round with a matching fund and let people donate to specific projects, um, which will then receive their payment on chain, and and they just have it right. So it's I, I'm talking about Gitcoin because the public goods funding space questions like how do we most effectively allocate capital, or how do we incentivize grant reviewers to do a really good job of mm -hmm. uh, deciding who gets grant money, like. There's no there's no link between uh, the outcome of the grant and the person making the decision about the grant. There's no incentive built there. But I think it would be interesting if if there were because maybe people. I mean, my my opinion is playing statistics when I look at the uh, European Horizon program. Mm -hmm. um, why do you invest ninety five billion in basic research, basically or uh, close to basic research, translational research? Um, it's just moving a, a sector forward. Yep. The the downside of this program always is there is no return and um, public grants. Uh, it's the function of public grants to fund projects in a space where it's very difficult to make money with that because exactly. otherwise exactly. no money would flow there. When I understand your explanation right, this uh, DSI movement uh, provides solutions that could also be used by European Union to say, okay, no, we don't hand out grants the old way because then it's tax money burdened. And statistically from 95 billion, there must be some cases that are commercially viable, mm -hmm. uh, but European grant funding doesn't capture that. So the taxpayer doesn't get anything in return. When you use these new models in principle, you can uh, put 95 billion into, for example, a system similar to Gitcoin. And when something comes out or VitaDAO using the VitaDAO structure, when something comes out of that, um, the team behind it can make sure that it gets licensed, that that money is then redistributed either in a value increase of the token, um, that basically the taxpayer, uh, let's just stay in that example, could sell their tokens at a higher price and make money out of that. Yeah. And also there is a different risk distribution because when I know as a business angel invest in a single project and the project fails with a 99.9% .9 chance, I've burned my money. When I put it in a basket of projects, of scientific projects, uh, I also participate in the 0.1% success chance of this one project. Yeah. So it's yeah. basically a completely new infrastructure to Absolutely. Uh, distribute yeah. capital in basic research. Totally. And, and impact investing and, and all sorts of things, right? Like it's just new tools for, for old problems. But again, because we can build incentives and reliable, verifiable uh, credentials and, and attribution, you know, contributions, it just opens up a lot of new possibilities for funding models, like retroactive funding models. You can see everyone who did this work and reward them for the work that was done after it was done, um, instead of them having to ask for money upfront or you know, it's it just creates new potential incentives, and there's because there's been a lot of thinking around public goods funding within within Web three and in the Ethereum community um, and elsewhere. I'm sure you know. I saw a lot of applications for that to basic science because, uh, and I'm quoting um, Evan Miozono, who works at Protocol Labs. He uh, he runs their network goods team. I think he's mm -hmm. done a lot of research into this, uh, and it, this is based on a talk that I I got to see him. Uh, give and you know what he said was like there's this problem of public goods funding and uh, there's two parts there's the amount of money coming in and then it's how it's being allocated right and there's a lot of ideas for how to improve the allocation of this capital make better grant systems there's like these s curves like there's a whole field of study around this um, that you're probably more familiar with than I am I'm sure and and then there's a the question of where does the money come from right and he he sort of pitched this idea. He said, maybe the only entities that should be investing or funding public goods and basic research specifically are nation states or things that look like nation states, maybe foundations, 
uh, things that have civilizational time scales for their investments, right? Like it's not really within the uh, it's it's not it's not it doesn't make sense for for any regular investor to invest in basic research because those investments may never pay off or might only pay off long after you're dead. It's like they're investing on civilizational timescales. If, if you look, I mean, I, I totally I totally agree to what you say. If you look at uh, the single asset, if you look at a single study, it doesn't. <clears throat> It absolutely, I completely agree. It doesn't make sense. I mean, pumping fifty thousand dollars into a basic research project is burning money. But statistically, uh, one in thousand is a hit. Yeah. But yeah. I, as a business angel, with not being a billionaire, cannot uh, spread the capital. Yeah. Wide enough. Uh, Elon Musk can. Uh, a nation state, and the nation state, I think, is a good example, just because they have larger budgets mm -hmm. and plan to exist in 20 or 30 years but it can also be a uh, jeff bezos uh, bill gates uh, elon musk uh, all the other billionaires totally. um yeah. how do you get retail investors into that game how do you get business angels into that game um these structures that you explained might be a possibility because you can also participate i mean you participate in the entire pool at the end of the day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that honestly i actually never thought of this specific case and and I'm very excited to think about this some more. I mean, off the top of my head, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think technologically there are protocols we could build using existing crypto technology to basically make some sort of DAO that invests in civilization, you know, <laughs> invests in basic research. And if any of that basic research pans out, you have proof that you contributed to this and can participate in the upside. That's a very, very cool idea. Um, there are some interesting experiments happening already within the space, people developing protocols, uh, things called hypercerts, which are on-chain impact certificates. Super cool work from protocol labs folks uh, that, that I really admire and respect who care a lot about these topics. And, and it's basically creating uh, digital objects that, that prove your contribution to something or that you supported something, um, which could enable things like on-chain impact bonds, that already exists in say carbon markets. So it's it's these impact certificates on chain and it makes impact into something that is a scarce digital object. And some people say, uh, you know, legitimacy is the scarcest resource of all. So if you can then prove that you've supported a lot of things that made a huge impact, maybe that is valuable in the future. And maybe this creates new funding possibilities, sort of like what you said, right? Like if you were investing in a basket of impact and then there's a prize for whoever makes the most impact because the government really cares about sequestering carbon um then everybody who participated in that will get a cut of that prize right so i think we could do these things it's just a you know question of getting everyone involved it comes back to a social problem like we have the technology to coordinate it and to to do this in a trustless way uh, so nobody's getting scammed but it's it's, 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 people it's, to it's it's a marketing question i mean when i think back Market, to my yeah. journey in crypto 2010 I didn't understand what this thing can do. 2017 was still the same. I saw the price going up. But basically, I remember only Bitcoin and Ethereum in 2017. Buying Bitcoin was incredibly difficult still yeah. in 2017. 2020 changed it. Um, it became more accessible. Coinbase became better. Also, the crypto exchanges here in Europe became better. Uh, and now you can really roll it out. But what you mentioned, I mean, we talk, we've always talked about distribution of capital. It's also a problem that I understood from LinkedIn that funds have with the LPs. I mean, investing in venture capital funds is basically illiquid capital at the end of the day. It, it sits there yeah. for 10 years and you can't get it out once it's in. But also when you put the fund on a DAO structure, um, given that the fund... Uh, is good in marketing you give they give their lps on one hand the opportunity if they really need capital back before the the term of the fund ends they can sell the coin i mean probably they have to accept the downside but it becomes a little bit more liquid mm -hmm. and on the other hand it would also open up uh their fundraising to smaller investors so which is usually not attractive to talk with uh, a lot of people but if you can do it by a DAO structure yeah sounds, it sounds interesting feasible yeah yeah I uh I totally agree and I you know I I just when we have to wrap up soon so I wanted to make a couple comments on design in general and why I'm personally bullish on it um 
again, I, I believe that crypto or blockchain distributed ledger technology, it is the future of technology, future of the internet. And, you know, one day every, everything is going to be running on systems like this. People aren't going to be aware of it. It's just going to be the same user experience we're all used to. But it, again, opens up all sorts of new possibilities for incentive and mechanism design, um, which gets people to work together and to, to play nice together and to do the things that they should do or that you want them to do or that is best for the the general good right like positive sum games become possible um and we can dis disincentivize you know extractive behaviors so crypto is very cool yes. um a book i recommend it's a uh, game Mark theory <laughs> it. okay it's yeah. out, of, out of strategy he describes it very well in this book understandable but you the concepts that you were talking about i mean you're taking out the possibility of fraud of the system yep. you can uh write the rules into code yep. and the code cannot be changed so everybody who buys into the system agrees to accept the code of contact yep. and this cannot be changed and uh humans have a tendency to try to change it so exactly that's, that and that's, that's the thing right it's like you know with with crypto your bank can't freeze your assets Sure, somebody can decide not to accept money from you or from a specific address, but your bank can't prevent you from accessing your funds in this system. Um, and I think like decentralized finance is very important, very interesting, and it's only going to get bigger and bigger and slowly leak into the traditional financial world and institutions. But the thing about crypto and, and all the people building this technology is they are excited for other use cases. And I think science is a really good use case for blockchains um, because a shared source of truth is very useful for science and for the social games around science, the reputation, the publishing, um, the funding problems. Like these are all things I think blockchains can be an important part of products that try to solve or new social systems that we buy into collectively because we all trust the rules that we've built for it, um, which just has improvements over the old system. But again, I'm bullish on DeSci uh, and think that it can maybe succeed where the open science movement did not because we have all these people in crypto who are excited to work on these things and build these things. And when I went to my first conference uh, for, for Ethereum stuff two years ago, uh, Ethereum Denver 2022, you know, I thought it was just, I didn't know what to expect, but I got a travel grant because I was getting involved in DeSci things um, to go there and, and attend the first DSI conference. Like DSI is such a new thing. It only became a thing two years ago when Vita Dow launched, really. But I don't know if the term was coined by then even. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's like, there's excitement there. There's really smart people coming from outside of crypto into crypto to use this technology to solve problems. There's people who have been doing crypto since the beginning who are excited to apply it to important things like science, um, like DAOs and, and all this, like, so I think this confluence of, of talent and intellectual energy, like I was very impressed by this conference uh, that I went to Ethereum Denver because everyone was very interesting, very smart, very excited to talk about using this technology to solve real world problems. Um, and sure, we, we everybody wants to make money and the DeFi stuff is interesting and people talk about that too. But, you know, we would get together and just just nerd out. And it was the intellectual energy that I was fueled by uh, when I went to academic conferences that I saw there. The difference was there's like a lot of money and open bar and it was like a big party and everyone was like crypto. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of what showed me like, yeah, public good stuff, coordination problems, incentive design, applied to good things, legit smart people who are passionate about this, working on it. This is the industry where I need to work. And, and this is why I think DSI will succeed because those people want to work on this. And maybe it's partially motivation or like from money um but but there's also people who have enough money and just want to work on cool things within the space um and yeah i think i think a big part of DSI, just closing thoughts maybe is like scientists don't know about DSI. DSI is very new um scientists don't know about crypto but if we as a community can can do outreach and also build tools that just help scientists I think that's how this succeeds, right? Like the focus has to be on building a product that is useful for scientists, not some crazy money game for scientists to play. They're not necessarily interested in that. But if you can help them get funding more easily or help them collaborate more easily or help them run their computationally intensive code on a dis distributed network, 
um, and then have it published with like provenance over that data, th that's useful. That's useful for scientists. And then you can start to build the other layers that enable better coordination and better incentives. And that's how DSI succeeds. Like in terms of investing in DSI, I mean, there's, there's of course the biotech investing that we've talked a lot about. Um, lots of early stage product projects and products that I think are trying to trying to figure out how they can find product market fit and make something that's um, that's going to make money, but also do good for the world. Um, and yeah, I guess like a, also closing note, any any um, any listeners who are interested in digging deeper into DSI, there's tons of talks on YouTube now. Um, there's some I, I have a podcast pinned on my Twitter. That I did with Bankless, which is a big crypto podcast talking about DSI um, to give maybe some other perspective. And I'm also happy to, to point people towards resources. Um, the Ethereum Foundation has a page on DSI, which has a lot of links. Sure. Um, but yeah, yeah. Molecules would... DSI Berlin just happened, and I think those are recorded and available. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff. All the topics we've talked about are, are covered there in different talks and mm -hmm. workshops. So there's kind of something for everyone if this gets people excited. Now I'm thinking about inviting more people, more speakers uh, from that area to the podcast. Uh, I, I think I slowly understand what you're talking about. Um, I, I see the potential. So after our conversation that uh, some crucial problems can be solved, but I think it means really remodeling the entire patent system and the entire publication system and the way we deal with these old systems that are slow and nobody likes it. Let's just face it. This way. <laughs> so face it this totally. Way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm not like I don't think it'll be easy, um, but it's it's sort of uh, I'm gonna quote quote a friend who talked about crypto being being like a Trojan horse for all of capitalism in in some ways, right? Like it's just technology that slowly replaces existing systems which are inefficient. Um, but this I mean so then creates new possibilities, like all the cypherpunk uh visionaries who wrote about this uh, this movement you know in the 90s and 80s all the stuff that they want to see more equitable worlds facilitated through digital technology like this becomes possible when this is the technology that the world is running on um so we need to solve problems and build good products with it and then we can we can advance the social layer because we have the the technological infrastructure to play the the shared games that let us all win um, I mean, when we try it, and maybe we had five minutes or so, when we try to yeah. mint it into a vision, how could it look like? I mean, the picture that I have in mind after your explanation is that in future, let's say 50 years down the road, that nobody feels threatened, um, a scientist uh, has an idea, uh, draws from a pool of capital, just uh, hands in uh, his, his, his grant application, gets capital distributed from a DAO structure, and automatically it's minted on an nft and the only thing he has to do then is uh, attach the data when he has finished his experiment and mm -hmm. this is all he has to worry about no patent application everything is already ingrained or uh can you say it ingrained in this nft so yeah. all rules all rules of commercial distribution all rules of uh so of reputation of social attribution all rules of prior art i mean who needs a patent when this is uh already done you don't need to find a patent because everybody who wants to use the data has to pay for it yep yep or own a piece of it or or recognize how, how would how would how would you describe the vision the future with it with what how, how yeah. would would you see the future scientists work future science work so <laughs> i like i like this question and in, i, I in, the, in this DSI, in this DSI yeah, space. In this DSI space. yeah i mean I think thinking about the the date, like you know, scientists spend way too much time applying for grants. Um, you already talked about how maybe we could decrease that time and let scientists spend more time on science. Um, I mean, I think a lot of uh, scientists day to day would still look very similar. You're doing science in the lab, but now maybe there are systems where you have to put your data in a specific structured way that it's like a shared database, which other people can access. And maybe then even if you're not taking money from a DAO, maybe your data is there and you don't reveal the details of it, but somebody can see that you did work with this gene or this disease, and maybe they can pay you to access that or or they can find you and collaborate because it's this open graph of knowledge that we're generating together. Um, maybe you uh, have an idea for some drug discovery program 
a screen that you think makes a lot of sense based on preliminary results. You can put a proposal out and find people through some, some you know, network of scientists to work on this. And you upload your results into the same shared database that is represented as, say, an NFT. And then anybody who participates and, and does experiments and contributes to this has some ownership over that, that shared data, which you know you can then maybe use to get more funding to advance the drug discovery program. Um, you know, all the publication records, everyone who's done everything in a project, that's all on chain and indexed and anybody can find this and you can prove all the work you've done and have other people vouch for you um, with, you know, consequences for doing things that will damage your reputation or, or, you know, if you lie, there's mechanisms that punish you. So you don't lie. There's no, you're disincentivized to lie. Like it's all these things that people should be doing, but they don't because they care about getting the publication. So they falsified data, experiments aren't reproducible. But if there's a penalty for um, your data being unreproducible, maybe people will be more careful to make to document things well. Or, or maybe even better, there is a prize for reproducing someone else's work. So if, if you can do your work in a way that is very reproducible and other people can reproduce it, this fixes the reproducibility problem because there are prizes that will be distributed for somebody generating identical data that they can prove has been independently done you know it's um it's these little things that i think aggregate to to much more innovation happening much more discovery and making science something that's more say lucrative for people like i i would love it if all the smartest students uh leaving high school they decided to go into science and again no offense to anybody who does finance but like for example all the smartest people i went to high school with they all wanted to do quantitative finance and make a ton of money and they're like i'm really smart i'm gonna get rich you know so they went and they studied that. But what if they could be similarly rewarded for generating new knowledge for humanity, you know? And I, I think that's why the money part is important, but that builds on top of the reputation layer, the publishing, the provenance, the, the everything, right? It's all, it's all connected. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think universities will continue to exist. PhD training programs will continue to exist. Uh, you know, you need to learn from people working in the lab, doing the experiments. Um, but more people will be able to contribute to serious academic work remotely in a decentralized way. And you won't need to be in any specific place to contribute to some cutting edge research um, and still be recognized for that for that work. Um, I think I think that's the future that I'd like to see for DSI. Um, like, I think one more thing I like to say is if we can allow scientists to capture more of the value that they're creating, that will be good for science because scientists get an incentive to create value and to do things that move the needle and progress knowledge um, instead of just getting comfortable and lazy or, or whatever, you know? And I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case, but it, it happens, right? Um, so if we can build the right incentives and then create these reputation games um, that maybe will help people make a lot of money, but at the very least improve the practices and institutions of science, then we'll have won. Um, so yeah, I think on-chain publishing is, is going to be a thing. Um, I think we'll see the academic publishing industry get disrupted for sure, because you know a DAO could be a publishing house basically, right? And the contributors to the DAO who are getting paid in the DAO's token or something and who own some, you know, however it goes, you know, the peer reviewers can get paid through the system. Um, and yeah, there are going to be people who have to do copy editing and formatting and, and typesetting and all that still for online publishing. Um, but they can capture the value that they're creating. I mean, the question yeah. is how do you sell these to universities <laughs> and uh, disrupt the I mean, yeah, I, it, 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 it would take some time. I mean, it needs guys like me, finance guys, because the systems are complicated and slow. Um, the the traditional systems, you have to pick prop with the traditional systems, you have to pick problem that you cannot do a lot of microtransactions. Now we have over 8 billion people on the planet and soon it will be 9 and 10. And all the systems are built to handle a few thousand people, basically. Yeah. So these decentralized structures or blockchain technology is the first time in humanity that you can really scale the number of transactions. Very simple, very easy in a, in a set, uh, in a structured rule set that doesn't change over time. This is a big problem. I mean, you need 
guys mm -hmm. who want to make a lot of money so that you have someone who aggregates money to invest money to move from humanity forward if you can automate this process yeah you don't need these old structures anymore and you can do much more uh transactions i mean for example transactions for one euro with a credit card was in principle for a very long time not uh commercially viable yeah case uh just imagine you want to do transactions in in a sense areas uh peer reviews for example i mean uh it's probably not a well-paid uh, area but uh you can do millions of transactions uh for cents when you have the right infrastructure mm -hmm. and you then can make more money with that it's just peer review more uh, yep. but currently it's just too complicated i mean everybody must write uh an invoice for five dollars or six dollars and it's just amazing yeah peer review is not paid at all it's done as volunteer work by leaders in the field i guess or whoever is invited to peer review an article but yeah if we could if we can get more people doing this and maybe if you can if you can if you can automate it i mean you don't have to think about it it's just exactly. just take out them say every peer reviewer when something at one point in time um hits the home run and makes 100 million uh 0.01% goes to these 10 peer reviewers and yeah. if this is autom automatic let's call it this way then it's a case but currently i mean when i think about a pharma company 15 years down the road um buys an asset and pays a billion nobody sits down and traces back thousands of people and say okay who 15 years ago uh in 2000 or 23 years ago did a peer review on this one article that we use but if you really can put it into a token or into mm -hmm. an nft mm -hmm. the whole history and the money is automatically distributed you just have to push the button and say okay i pull it uh pfizer for example i pull it 10 mi yeah. 10 billion and it flows downstream. Done. <laughs> yeah, be ideal world. It's it's. Uh, I think we will see this one day. I don't know how it's going to look. And again, all the problems we're talking about in science, they they're hard problems, and they're not necessarily problems that are high value to, to try to solve as an entrepreneur, right? And this is this is where I'm thinking. I have a lot of ideas for things for DSI, but thinking about my next career steps, I'm you know. I, I have to think of it like a like a business person like okay is this going to return you know the investment in time and if I fundraise for something will I be able to create a return for my investors um so now it's like this tricky thing where we need to build these things but there also has to be some sort of business rationale behind it um so it's tough and they're tough problems to begin with beyond beyond that additional aspect um but again you know I think tough problems are are worthy of of time and energy and uh and that's what makes life fun but yeah it's uh it's it's honestly it's a very exciting time and, and i think the dci community is full of really genuine and driven passionate brilliant people which is why i'm so excited to keep working on all of this um I could spend all day talking about everything, <laughs> like everything we've talked about. I'm like, oh, I have so much more to say. <laughs> um, so if again, for viewers, I'm I'm available if you want to DM me, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever. Um, happy to answer questions, point you in the direction of of more resources to to go deeper into any of the topics. Um, because there's there's a lot to cover. And it's it's like the the convergence of blockchain and I guess biotech, biopharma, and then science. And there seems to be a pretty small set of people who have experience across all three. So usually there's someone who has to learn at least one of those who's interested in this, um, which is also what makes it what makes it fun. Um, but definitely it's like a it's still it's still a small, tight knit community. So if you're interested, uh, we welcome you. And there's always conferences happening and workshops and meetups around the world. Um, a lot of major cities have D side groups that do meetups or host events. There's one in Boston coming up um or did that already happen berlin just happened there will be one in denver next march um paris just happened like there's d size growing and uh the more the merrier because <laughs> we want to fix science super boris thank you very much for this fantastic conversation i learned a lot of new things there is a lot going on in this space that i was not aware of uh let's stay in touch if you can recommend speakers to 
dive into different aspects of this, uh, feel free. I'm happy to host other people too. And awesome. I wish you a nice weekend and keep pushing forward. Keep Thank solving you. the hard problems. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Yeah, I'm going to go work on some science now. Um, I had a lot of fun chatting. Thank you for inviting me to, to join the podcast. You're welcome. Have a great weekend. Have a great evening or day. Sure. Bye. <laughs>